Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry we're a few minutes late, but I'm delighted that we're about to start. I'd like to welcome all of you to the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. How many students do we have in the room? Awesome. Give yourselves a hand and welcome. I'm, I'm Frank Sesno. I'm the director of SMPA, and I'm delighted uh, that you and we are here tonight for what will be a simply fascinating and very important conversation uh, with people who are both on the front lines of history and who make history because of what they do and of who they are. Um, it is our place here and some really our privilege at SMPA to host conversations like this uh, that bring remarkable people who do remarkable things um, and sometimes very difficult conversations to this stage. Tonight what you'll hear is, as I said, that front row seat on history. And being a woman of color, um, at this time and in this place is something that is too rare and um, that we need to be thinking about on a lot of different levels. And so I know your uh, thoughts will be challenged with that and I think probably in places you'll be regaled by some of the stories um, along the way. Um, it is a pleasure and a privilege for me as well to introduce uh, to you um, a very special student who is going to introduce uh, Professor Thompson and bring out the panel. Uh, she is a junior. She is a journalism major. She has done remarkable things here at GW and beyond, and she happens to be president of the GW Association of Black Journalists. Uh, Lauren Hill is in her um, prime of her life, I would like to say, here <laughs> at GW. She's the assistant editor of GW's Ace Multicultural Magazine. She interned last summer at the Afro-American newspaper here in D.C., I think she's destined to go on to a really remarkable career, and she is launching right here. So would you join me, please, in welcoming Lauren Hill, and have a very, very good evening tonight. Thank you, Professor Cessno. Good evening. My name is Lauren Hill, and I'm the president of GW's Association of Black Journalists. And this is our third major event in as many years. This event is being streamed live on GW SMPA and the Afro-American newspaper Facebook's pages. I would first like to thank the School of Media and Public Affairs for helping plan tonight's event and the Black Heritage Celebration Committee for allowing our organization to be a part of another great series of programming during the month of February. Our organization believes it is important this year to discuss the Trump administration from the perspective of black women journalists, a group whose voices have historically been suppressed, but who refuse to be silenced. Tonight's panel, which will be introduced shortly, includes some of the best and most recognizable journalists who cover this country's elected officials. I hope each of you leave here tonight with a better understanding of the challenges that come with being a woman of color and a journalist during such unique juncture in our nation's history. It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight, Professor Cheryl W. Thompson. Professor Thompson teaches investigative reporting and news writing at GW and has spent the last 21 years writing for the Washington Post. She has covered the Justice Department, immigration, DC police, the White House during Barack Obama's first term, and spent more than a dozen years on projects and investigative teams. She shared the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting in 2002 and won an Emmy Award in 2011 for a series on guns in her prison interview with a young man from Chicago who killed a police officer. She has two NABJ Salute to Excellence Awards, a Headliner Award, and dozens of other national and regional awards. She was part of the Post team that did a year-long series on police shootings, which won a Pulitzer in 2016. She was named NABJ's 2017 Journalism Educator of the Year. Professor Thompson has bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She is vice president of the Investigative Reporters and Editors Board, the first African American to hold that position, and serves on the board of the Fund for Investigative Journalism. She is also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Without, <laughs> without further ado, Professor Thompson. Shouldn't y'all be studying? <laughs> so 
Come on out. This is our panel. She's being shy. April's being shy. I got you. <laughs> Malika Henderson knows more about political campaigns than most people. Mm. As a senior political reporter for CNN and my former colleague at the Washington Post, she is simply <laughs> one of the best political reporters in the country. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. I met Yamich Alcindor, I like to call her Yamichi. She probably hates that. <laughs> Nine, years <ago. laughs> Nine years ago, when she came to the post as an intern, fresh out of that other G school down the street, uh, Georgetown, I was thrilled to be one of her mentors. She was fearless, feisty, and dogged traits that make her the amazing reporter she is today. And she also, I have to say, she just took a new job with PBS. She gave up a job at the New York Times mm. to go to P I know. <laughs> <laughs> and she's also a contributor to MSNBC. Whether it's discussing tax reform or writing about Rob Porter, you mm. guys know Rob Porter? <laughs> <laughs> Bet you didn't know him before a couple days ago, did you? That's right. <laughs> Trump's former staff secretary who resigned this week amid allegations of spousal abuse, twice. Darlene Superville is a rock star at the Associated Press, her home for the last three decades. I know, she was like, did you have to? <laughs> and I was like, well, actually, three decades sounds better than 30 years. <laughs> okay. Uh, neither one. <laughs> <laughs> the NYU graduate has covered former First Lady Michelle Obama, and she's covered the White House since 2009. Well, well, well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Whether it's confronting Sarah Huckabee Sanders over the president's treason comments or lashing out at a fellow journalist who clearly didn't know you uh, for invoking her name at the end of a White House press briefing. Oh my goodness. April Ryan takes, <laughs> I saw the video. April Ryan <laughs> takes no prisoners. The Baltimore native joined the American Urban Radio Networks in 1997 and was one of the first White House correspondents to talk to me when I joined the ranks during Obama's first term. You probably don't remember that, but pretend like you do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so welcome. So we want to have a frank discussion, no, not says no, <laughs> a frank discussion um, about what's going on in the Trump administration and how, what it's like as a woman of color, a black woman, an African American woman to cover it, and April's already giving me looks. So <laughs> first question, journalists, including the White House press corps, are under attack from the unconventional administration, this unconventional administration. How do you deal with racially coded policies and statements? In other words, how do you keep your balance? Hmm. April, you first. <laughs> how do you keep it balanced? Um, it's not about me, it's about the story. And that's what we really aim to do, it's about the story. Um, that room has never been a room that reflects America, number one. And unfortunately, it seems like um, when you look like me, you stand out like a pink elephant. Um, I sit smack dab on the third row. You can't miss me. And they don't miss me. They choose to overlook me at times. But you can't miss me. But um, covering this White House as an African-American woman has been tough. It's, that's a beat that is, it's, it's, it's a beat that's not kind to anyone. But when you are not part of the mainstream, mainstream press, I'm not, I'm specialty media. Specialty media meaning I have a certain niche. I talk about or question uh, about primarily urban issues, black issues. And, but I also ask everything. But when you, um, 
cover this administration and, and working on those issues, particularly when this administration, I am not perceived as their base, uh, it's tough. Um, it's very tough. And um, you know, there have been attacks. Um, there's been retaliation for questions. But it's not about me. Unfortunately, I have been in the news. But it's not about me. It's about the story. And when you look at it as the story and not yourself, you can, you can move on. You can keep going back every day. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm asking questions like anyone else would, be it black, white, man, woman, Jew, Gentile, Protestant, or Catholic. I'm asking questions like all the rest of these great women and others who've covered that place. Um, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, the most magnificent place in the world. Thank you, April. Um, and I just want to say I'm delighted to be here with all of these women who I've known, uh, you I've known for years. Uh, not that really long. We're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting to, to be here. Um, I will say this. I think for me, and I don't cover the White House every day in the way that these women do. I'm not in the briefings as, as, as they are. Um, but I think for me, I think I see my role as sort of reflecting how people um, feel uh, and are registering and analyzing these, this president's words, particularly when it re in regards to race. And I go back to um, interactions I've had with voters uh, as they were assessing this candidate and some of the things that he would say and their real reactions, feelings about, uh, you know, maybe you use words like sort of racially tinged, uh, racial undertones. Some people uh, use the phrase racist. But I think, I mean, if you look at the way this president talks about race and deploys race, I think it's pretty clear, and I've written about this, uh, that he is playing the race card, right? I mean, he does. Uh, you know, you hear criticisms about the left playing identity politics, right, because they talk about Black Lives Matter or, or they talk about the Dreamers. Well, it's also true that, that President Trump uh, it plays white identity politics. I think it's, it's pretty evident if you look at the data, if you look at the polling uh, in terms of how a lot of his voters feel about race and a, a sense of kind of racial grievance and racial resentment. So I think that's the way I deal with it. it, it try to talk about the data, try to talk about what how he talks about race, right, and if you kind of put together Together, the ways in which he talks about African Americans, for instance, very easily calling for the firing of NFL players of Jamel Hill, uh, not so easily calling for the firing of Rob Porter, uh, calling knee. yeah, calling uh, Frederica Wilson an empty barrel. This was John Kelly essentially making up a story about this black congresswoman. So yeah, I mean, I think that's the way I deal with it. In terms of how I feel personally about it, this is our jobs. You know, this is we we got in in this business uh, to 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 uh, hold people's feet to the fire, uh, to reflect the voices of the wide range of folks in this country. So I think that's the way that that I deal with it. I think for me, I ask myself pretty often, why am I still a reporter, and what am I actually here to do? And the question I always go back to is this young boy, Emmett Till, who was killed um, in Mississippi as, as a teenager. Um, and that sparked the civil rights movement. And I think of myself as a civil rights journalist, and no matter what beat I'm doing, and I've covered everything from dead whales washing up on the beach to crime to transportation, and now at the White House, I think that the story of America is the story of race. Um, so when I think of the questions that I'm asking or the stories that I'm going to write, I'm thinking, OK, well, what, it, what are we learning about our country? And what are we learning about how um, the differences in race continue to, to color how people's lives are in, in, in real ways? Um, and I don't believe in false equivalencies. So I think you can be fair, but you don't have to always be. There was, there was no false equivalency. Like, segregation was just bad. So I, if I, I think of if I was writing in the 1960s, I would just say there really wasn't there, like the Charlottesville wasn't something that was bad on both sides. So I think as a reporter, and I'm, I'm growing into that, feeling like I can say, no, that was actually not OK. So I'm Haitian American. When the president was talking about as whole countries and talking about um, Haitians and, and, and questioning what Haitians have been doing for America, I was able to get on TV and say, well, one, that's wrong for you to say that Haitians aren't contributing. And two, you should go to Savannah, Georgia, because there's a monument showing that Haitians have actually contributed to the American revolutionary, that free blacks came and helped America get founded and helped you free you from your own people 
um, in, in the form of Britain. So I think that that's what I do to, to, to stay balanced in my mind. And I want to come back to your Haitian question, a little, your response a little later. Darlene? Yeah, how do I keep it balanced? Um, one thing I would say is that I exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Keep exercising. It helps, you know, sort of relieve the stress. It's a stressful place. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, but, it's, but as April said, it's a hard place to cover whether you're black or white, male or female. It's just hard being a White House reporter. Mm -hmm. um, I have not experienced any kind of personal animus directed toward me because I'm a black woman. Um, and I have a different audience than April does. My audience is a lot broader than, than hers. Um, but one thing I do try to keep in mind is that there is life outside of the White House after work. Pursue your interests, um, and that'll take some of, the, some of the sting out of whatever happened to you that day. Do you guys, you know, race has been, race is like such an issue in this administration. Do you remember? another administration or former administration where race played such a role, even in the Obama administration, race didn't come up <laughs> as frequently as it does you know, now. Race has touched every president in some way, shape, or form. But in the last 21 years that I've been at the White House, we started out, Sonia Ross is in the audience from AP. Um, we were there together. It was, a, it was a large contingent of black reporters at the time in the, at the Bill Clinton era, the President Bill Clinton. And he was dealing with Africa, um, putting a focus on Africa. He was also putting a focus in on healing the racial divide and talking about the heart. Then when you came to George W. Bush, you know, he intrinsically knew why his audience was not, or his base was not black. He regaled about, you know, I'm Republican because of my father, because I was the governor of Texas because of, um, you know, the, the, the death penalty issue in Texas. And he just kept going on and on. But then when Katrina hit, and one of the issues is if he would have put a little bit more equity into or stayed into the black community, like when he did Africa or different things with Africa, he didn't want to tout it because they felt that the black people, black, the, the black population was not his base. If he would have done a little bit more in saying who he was, it would not have been so rough when Katrina hit. So then you had, um, and I thought those were two newsy presidents. We'd never have another newsy president again. <laughs> then you get this guy who <laughs> has this bop and these ears and this name who really mesmerized both Democrat and Republican for one reason or, or Republican uh, audiences for one reason or another. And everything about him, race. It was just race all over, just because he was a black man. Mm -hmm. And the spotlight was on the black community because here you have a black man rising to the highest of heights and then there's still such of a problem or, or so many ills in the black community. Race touches everything. From, from covering this White House over 21 years, race touches everything. And it's always on the table from, from what Bill Clinton told me years ago and, and subsequently all the other presidents. And then with this president, race is definitely a factor. When you talk about Colin Kaepernick and change the narrative of why he's taking a knee, bringing in the NFL, causing a rift with players, not players, but, but yeah, causing a rift with players and the NFL and those who watch. When you, when you talk about um, sons of what, you know, then when you go to S-hole comments, and we heard also from Maggie Haberman, who's a white reporter, who said that he said something to the effect of, if the Nigerians come here, they wouldn't want to go back to their huts, and all Haitians have HIV and AIDS. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what Maggie's reporting, and Maggie's a very credible journalist. And I mean, you know, we heard from the campaign trail, Make America Great Again, code words. So race has played, I mean, in these last 21 years, I've seen race play out in some of the best of ways and some of the worst of ways. And the unfortunate thing is, you can legislate all you want, but it ultimately comes down to a heart issue, and the president is the moral leader. He sets the tone. And I'll say this, I think um, as someone who wasn't covering the White House when Obama was, was in office and who really covered more the campaign of Donald Trump and the campaign of Bernie Sanders, so I was out there on a bus for like a year and a half, Obama, well, I think the narrative about Obama was that America had reached this place where we were able to, that a black man had gotten this big job, so America was getting so much better, and that we were all, that there was going to be this great moment, and black people everywhere were going to somehow improve, their lives were going to improve because of Obama. I think that what was lost 
um, in that narrative was how many people were angry to see a black man and a black family on their TV every day, and how many people were mad at their own shortcomings because of the economy wasn't working out for them. And I don't mean that there's, so there's two things, like there's a idea like, oh yeah, people are mad at Obama because of the economy. But I mean that if you're someone who already has a predisposition not to like African Americans, and then you can't get a job, and there's job numbers are coming out every day saying, oh, the economy's getting better, and now you have to watch two black girls on TV wearing $1,000 dresses, it does something for you. To me, it doesn't just, it, it, it's not just about prejudice anymore, it's about your actual lived experience looking at what you could do. And America, in a lot of ways, has told, I would say, straight white men that you have the privilege, that you are the one who's gonna be able to do everything. But that obviously is the case for everybody, that there are obviously straight white men who are struggling, who cannot get jobs, who are living in basements, who have issues, and that's just catapulting it. So I think that that wasn't, as, a, as someone who wasn't a full-fledged reporter yet, I read way more stories about Obama, about how great Obama's presidency was for America, and not as many stories about all the people that were like starting up anti, like starting up white nationalist groups or being very angry and stewing in their living rooms because they didn't like black people. But there were a lot of good stories. There yeah, I, and I think it, it was sort of the Tea Party, right? I mean, yeah. that was in, in part. In part, if you went to some of those rallies, yeah. I mean, oftentimes they would have signs: uh, "Send Obama back to Kenya." Uh, you know, there was one sign about his ugly daughters. So there was this sense that you could see. I mean, I think you you cover the Tea Party. Some of that language about taking our country back, uh, as if it had gone somewhere because of Obama. Um, and so, you, it went you know, to Kenya. It went to Kenya. Right, right. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, I think you know, you're right. I mean, this idea of sort of politics and race, it's always gone hand in hand. And I think the, the brilliance of Obama in running for the White House was that he didn't make anyone feel guilty about race and racism, right? I mean, a vote for uh, Obama was in some ways absolution, right, for this great sin and stain of racism uh, and this promise of, of post-race. And the way he did that, he had his own sort of sister soldier moment, right? Uh, and of course, the sister soldier moment is when Bill Clinton goes uh, and criticizes sister soldier, who is this black rapper, and he, he does that uh, in, a, in a crowd uh, at, a, at a Jesse Jackson conference, and, and, and so, so there's, there's this moment. And so for Obama, he does that by going to black uh, crowds and essentially saying, you've got to do better. You've got to pull up your pants. I mean, this whole idea of, of black respectability politics. So he does that, uh, and he signals to, I think, voters, particularly white voters, that he's not going to coddle African Americans, and he's not going to be the president of, uh, you know, of black America and put a basketball hoop up but that was uh, first in the White House. Obama. That yeah, that was first term Obama. That was first term You're exactly Obama. right. And second term, first, second, second term, term Obama. Totally yeah, yeah, yeah. It was he talked about race much more. Uh, he he actually said the N word, I think, in a podcast at, yeah. at some yes. point. In the garage. Uh, yeah, in, yeah, in the garage. Uh, he said, I think maybe the phrase "Black Lives Matter" at, at some point, but he was very careful uh, in running in 2008 and, and in 2012. And I think one of Hillary Clinton's great weaknesses as a candidate was, I think, she made people feel bad about. Race. I mean, she did sort of embrace the Black Lives Matter movement. She talked about racism, uh, and I think it, people didn't like that. Well, how has the how has the Trump presidency affected the conversation on race, mm. Darlene? <laughs> while, while while April is thinking about it, you want to respond? <laughs> I would say that under the Trump presiden presidency, the conversation about race is just more out there, it's more prominent again. Uh, we talked about him with the football players and kneeling f during the national anthem. That's generated a lot of discussion and in some cases protest. Uh, the, the issue of the comments that he made about Haiti, African countries, uh, and let's also remember that one of the biggest proponents of the birtherism issue against Obama was President Donald Trump, was, was Donald Trump before he was president. And he helped drive that idea that Obama was not born in America for many, many years and didn't give it up until recently. Yeah. Do you think it's, you think it's right, more barely. difficult to, um, to cover race with more context because of it? You know what, you have to, when, when we're covering, Everyone on the stage does a great job in digging and resources and talking.
But we have found, I believe, and, and they can say yay or nay to this, but I believe we've had to dig for more facts and stats to prove certain things are not correct because we have a president now who likes to go off feeling. <laughs> no, no, I mean, don't laugh, it's true. A lot of things, and then, and then he sets the tone for other people to, to pontif pontificate on CNN or any other uh, network. It's a great oh, network. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to say what they feel. And, and, and I'm gonna give you an example, okay? I'm gonna give you a big example. Let's go back, we, we haven't even talked about Charlottesville. Charlottesville really <laughs> exposed a lot. When the president had those teleprompters in his face, oh, we were like, whew, whew, we can breathe. But when he talked off the top of his head, the world shook. It was ugly. You know, you had David Duke former grand dragon of the KKK saying, look now, on Twitter. David Duke even chimed in again um, during the State of the Union when the president said Americans are dreamers too. David Duke said the same thing, a former grand dragon of the KKK. And yet, when going back to Charlottesville, he, Darlene, it was like it was six or seven times, correct? Because I know I was with him when he went to the, the military um, base at Fort McNair and was talking to um, the military, the president, because mm -hmm. he was trying to get it right. He kept doing, he kept doing, it was almost like an apology tour, try, an explanation tour, trying to explain what he was saying because, you know, both sides are good people. A girl died. A, a woman died. A white woman died. So race is exposed in its barest sense. This is not Archie Bunker. This is the president of the United States. And then when you have people going on, talking what they feel well, particularly when it comes to the issue of immigrants, we have forgotten that we pretty much, the vast majority of us, are not native of this land. Native Americans are. And we're telling people who, they can, who can come and who can go. And this is about, this, this immigration issue is about the browning of this nation. It's about the browning of this nation. We are a nation that is now seeing the numbers of babies born who are majority minority. So this is about the browning of the nation. So, and then when you have something like that, people are saying crazy things out of their mouths. Oh, well, we want people who bring, who bring something to the table. I'm like, wait a minute, talking about brown and black immigrants. So I, I remembered something for 2012 when they had this immigration discussion during the Obama years. This has been going on for a long time. I said, wait a minute, I read something from the Center for American Progress that said black immigrants are the most educated <laughs> immigrants, found it, went on TV, and everybody's quoting it. We have to really go by fact now as journalists and pull up those stats because people think you're race baiting, you're lying, and we, because this president is so quick to tweet something, say something in the crowd, and, and then celebrate the black unemployment rate when it just happened along the way. And seriously, they're not targeting. So we have to really now be the reporters that we really are by digging and giving stats. Because you can say what you want, but stats and figures from credible organizations really back it up and show the truth. I think that the other thing is, um, as a reporter, I don't know if we would be having these conversations if Hillary Clinton had been elected. And I don't know if that means that we would have just been like, okay, well, that was a crazy election, and people said some crazy things. <laughs> but you know, most people don't really think that way. And it's like, well, there's a lot, there's like at least 33 million or something that think that way. So what does that say about our country? I've talked to a lot of people whose personal lives are gonna, or whose personal lives are gonna be harder because of some of the policies that Donald Trump is talking about. I'm talking about people who might lose their health insurance or Medicaid. I'm talking about a couple who um, might lose money that would have repaired their roof, who said, you know what, I'm, and who, who said, I'd rather, have, I'd rather have Mexicans stopped at the border than my own roof fixed. I've talked to people who are gonna lose their medical care. I'm a woman who was in Ohio who said, you know, I just don't like that all the taxi drivers are black now in, in Columbus, Ohio. So there's a real thing that people are seeing America brown and are realizing that even when it, even, even if their own personal safety or own personal well-being, they choose race over that. And I think that it's a, it's a good conversation to be having. And I think as a reporter, I'm happy to see people having to write stories that don't just look like me. Because having, having to write stories about race 
as part of the White House beat, not just saying, okay, well, we have a race reporter and we have an urban affairs reporter, so those people can handle those issues, issues and the rest of the newsroom can just go about like this isn't happening. I think that newsrooms now have to cover race in almost every single beat, yeah. and I think it's, it's made the, the profession better. Yeah. Well, race has become such an issue, and I'll just ask straight out, because I'm a journalist. Is the president a racist? Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not in a position to say that. Um, I want to go call Mia's our you. spokesperson, yeah. just so you know. <laughs> she was just elected Look, our spokesperson. I want to go call on you first. <laughs> yeah. You just got your PR person you there with you. <laughs> you really have my PR person here. I was going to um, go to April. I'm yeah, go to April. Charlene? <laughs> 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 All right, so, okay, so. Um, <laughs> So with all, going back to the immigration thing around Martin Luther King, and let me, let, me, let me stop for a minute. It is a sad day when any reporter, black, white, whatever, has to ask a sitting U.S. president, is he a racist? It's a sad day. Let's start And you there. did it on Martin Luther King I did. day, right? I did. <laughs> but it was a sad day. It was, I did. You don't, I, look, at the base, I am a black woman. And I know what Dr. King did for me. I was torn that day, but I had to ask it. He was right there. When you hear credible people from the Hill, Hill lawmakers, federal lawmakers saying, he said this in this room. And the whole immigration debate kind of shifted because you don't know if you can work in, in under good conscience that this is really, you know, it's gonna work out this way. So I said, okay, I did it, I asked. Because the, the day before, I had queried a couple of, of sources and I asked the NAACP, the nation's oldest civil rights organization, what is the definition of a racist? And their definition was the intersection of racial prejudice and power. You said, you said it, I didn't. <laughs> so, uh, no, but I'm serious. And, when they, and now they're calling the nation's oldest civil rights organization is now calling the president of the United States a racist. You've had Congressman John Lewis. You've got a lot of people. Maxine even, Waters, yep. Yeah, a lot of white <laughs> people are also calling him that, too. I'm not calling, but when you have a pattern that continues and then questions about issues of the Confederacy. Yeah, I mean, and if you look at the data on this and you look at polling, uh, there was a Quinnipiac poll a couple of weeks ago. This was shortly after the S-hole comment. Uh, and it showed something like over 60% of the people who responded to this question, which was, do you think the president uh, respects black people as much as he respects white people? 60% uh, of the people said, no, he doesn't respect black people as much as he uh, respects white people. And it was something like 17% of Republicans, I mean, which is almost 25, that's almost one in five. And that was a data point that was interesting, that, that Republicans also, the, 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 the question is, do people think that's a problem, right? Maybe, maybe they think it's fine that he doesn't respect black people uh, as, much as, as much as he respects white people, uh, but that's what the data shows. And I, I think just sort of, just in terms of the country, like what does it mean for the country, for citizens uh, to think that a sitting US president, president uh, is racist, right? And, and you talk to Republicans and they all say, oh, well, Democrats always think that, you know, that, that Republicans- but this is different. Play sort of fast and loose in the race card and, and and that Republicans uh, have racial animus, but this is at a different level. This is I think. a different. Well, level. nobody called, nobody suggested George Bush, George right, W. I think Bush that's was right. racist. I think Other than right. Kanye well, no, West, Kanye and West, all the people, <laughs> and all okay. the people, all really? the people in New Orleans. Okay, Orleans. so <laughs> I, I want to say this: I interviewed Donald Trump's ex-girlfriend, who is half black. Really? Um, who, wait a minute, who? Wait, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I missed that. Can you go back? Can you go back? I interviewed, I interviewed Donald Trump's ex-girlfriend. Wait a minute, Donald Trump Jr. or Donald, Donald Trump? Donald Trump, the president. Oh, wait a minute. Who dated oh, a, a girl who was half black. And is friends with rappers, Al and, Sharpton. Right, so yeah. I asked her, do you think he's racist? And she said, I can't, I don't know because he obviously dated me. I am a, I, I identify as a black woman. I am someone who, there was no question that he knew that I, that his, her mother, I want to say, is black. So there's no question that how I am half black. How long ago was this? And how long did it last? <laughs> this was, this was before Melania, right before Melania. So, so that's good that it was before Marla. Melania. Yeah, yeah, it was in between. You still married to Marla Maples. Yeah, or maybe in between Marla and, Marla it was in between Melania. Marla and Melania. How long did it last? Okay, this is turning into no, the maybe. Jerry Springer <laughs> show. <laughs> Okay. I, I did not know about this. I have a point to make after I give you the chance. Okay, so 
Anyways, so, so I asked her, I said, so what, what, why do you think he acts like this? And she said, well, he likes to hang around black people who are famous. He loved Russell Simmons. He loved Jesse Jackson. He was very surprised that black people liked tennis because they would go to the, like the US Open and he would just be like, why are all these people here? And they're like, oh, I guess Serena's playing. That's why all these people showed up. So there's this idea that, and I also asked Jesse Jackson, well, what's the deal? Because he gave Jesse Jackson free office space in one of his towers, and he would go to these meetings where people were trying to make Wall Street more, more Wall black. Street he would, project. And that was something that he did without cameras. Jesse Jackson said, look, he wasn't trying to prove a point. There wasn't some reality TV show. He actually got there and said, how can I help you guys? And then he actually helped and put money behind it. So there's this idea that it's, he's a complex relationship. And That's what I'm saying. saying. It's a very C complex on the thing. In, in his 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 Trump uh, Trump organization, put C on the application. Yeah. So that's the thing. So you have someone who's being sued by the federal government for writing color on applications, who's calling for the death penalty for innocent black men, who has yet to, from my understanding, apologize for that as of yes, today. Not yet. Um, but then you also have someone who's spending money trying to get people to, to more black people to work on Wall Street for no apparent reason, and who's dating a half black woman. So, so basically, he's have. a complex figure. Yeah. Is what and, you're saying. I think he probably has ideas about <laughs> class, right? I mean, he's, I, I think, one of the first presidents we've had that doesn't talk much about upward mobility, right? I mean, he talks about coal miners and getting jobs back to coal miners. He never necessarily says that a coal miner could become, uh, you know, could own the coal mining company, right? Um, so I think that's one of the most interesting things about him as well. And, and I think, you know, he does, he, he, he doesn't mind hanging out with African Americans. Americans who are wealthy. I think in some ways he might believe that the son of a coal miner uh, will grow up to be a coal miner and the son of a millionaire can do anything, right? I mean, one of the things he talks about in terms of all the people around them that recommend them to those jobs are their, is, is their wealth, right? Um, so I think, I think there's some, some, some ideas he has about class uh, as well that, that aren't always brought to bear in terms of the way we talk about him. And of course, if you ask black Republicans, they, there. I mean, there are some, of course, that have fled to the hills. But there are some <laughs> who will. Who, there are some who really will say no. He really does think about race. He think he's he's better to African Americans than Obama. I've heard them say so that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. Let's. That's, okay, I've wait, literally wait, heard wait, people wait, say wait. that. When we go without to, facts. When we go to the, and see, and this is a part of our actually our conversations and actually our beat. Because when you look at the black Republicans, there are two sects of black Republicans now. Yeah. You have the vanguard. Now, the vanguard is not talking like that. The new black Republican, who's David Clark, um, what are their names? Um, Paris. Paris Denard, Omarosa, and what's the name? Uh, uh, the, uh, the girls, the sisters. Um, you know who I'm talking about. What Lynn? No. Yes, Diamond and Silk. That's the. That's now that new crop, and then the Daryl Scotts. Yeah. That's that new crop of Republican who is not entrenched in politics, who thinks they're... And more, probably voted for Obama, right? I mean, I, yeah. I think there's a new Republican. I don't know what they Republican. did, but I know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also, inter I also interviewed the guy who we pointed to and called my African-American, and I... <laughs> that's what I like to do. I like to find characters, and... He also is someone who said, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed in the way that he's talked about Charlottesville. I'm disappointed in the way that he's dealt with the Justice Department, but I still support him. So you have these black Republicans, these new age black Republicans, mm -hmm. who actually go hand in hand with these new age white Republicans. Because there's a whole crop of new age, of course there are some people that are holdovers from other White Houses, and you guys know that better than me. But there's also a lot of Republicans that are working at the White House, like Hope Hicks and other people, who would never have been able to get a job oh, in the White House, new. but because now, because there was a faction of the Republicans who, who absolutely pushed Trump aside, they can't get jobs or are blacklisted, and you have these other people who are from New York that the president feels comfortable with. But there's a situation right now, the president said that this, this White House was, uh, what, during the first press conference, it was like a fine tune machine. No, mm. the cogs and wheels are falling out the machine, <laughs> flying out of the machine. But no, but seriously, this is, this is where, this is where, and it's sad because this new crop of people who are coming, and a lot of them are not, have no grasp of governance still, a year in. And the ones who really do, who want to help, are pushed out. And it goes to what Yamish said. I mean, there is a vanguard, be it black or white or any race, that wants to help. Um, and then some that say, you know, no, because this is not the best thing, because just how, 
People are scared to deal with this president because he will tweet them, he will be nasty to them, and he's a different breed. And, but, but the breed that's coming in understands this breed. It's, yeah. it's a different political game now. It's a different White House. It's a different way you handle things. Even Paul Ryan had to acknowledge that the president's language, okay, guys, the president's language is different in how he approaches things. There's a different day in Washington. And, 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 and covering this White House, I really believe that the goalpost has been moved. And I don't know if it will ever come back. Because well, there's a change. This has been a shift. I mean, can you imagine a president that doesn't tweet? Now, before, remember, we had the... People don't want uh, him the, to tweet. We had the tweets, dash, B-O, if he really wrote it. Right. <laughs> the one time you saw him at the computer typing a tweet, you were like, oh, Obama's social media doing it. And then... <laughs> Now it's but like Obama's tweeting was different than this. No, what I'm saying, that's, that's, the point. that's the point. What that's I'm saying point. is, could we go back to an Obama style president? But he's not I mean, Obama. I think the, I think a, no, what I'm, what I'm saying, I'm talking about the you mean social after media. Trump. Like yeah. if the next president says, sorry, my ha my team is handling Twitter, you'll see me with my I mean, initials. I, think, I, think I don't know. There could be Twitter fatigue, right? Yeah. By, by after this president and whoever the president <laughs> is is going to shape the presidency, right? In the way that Obama did. Obama didn't set the you know sort of the t the tone for. For, for Donald Trump. Donald That's Trump true. has set the tone set, uh, yes. for Donald Trump. So I, I sort of, this idea that Donald Trump has forever changed the presidency and will never go back, I think it's something that sort of gives him too much power, no, right? But, I mean, I think, I think, you know, whoever is, and oftentimes you have in politics that the person who comes after uh, is a, a sort of a response and a reaction against a rejection let me, let me, of Let me that, explain of why. Let me explain why I say that. It's because People, after Obama, people were looking for this superstar. They were looking for another rock star. It was either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, okay? Didn't they get one? Excuse me? Didn't they get one? Yes. Yeah. But they also, the key word was change. Well, I Obama, had a and, Obama and Donald Trump were change. But you didn't know what you wanted in the change. It's here. And the problem is you have a president who is now scaring Republicans in his own party who don't want to run for re-election. You've got, you've got people dealing in a different way than they have before. You've got issues on the books that are just kind of... But, but in some well, ways, he's incredibly successful, right? I mean, if is you think he really about, successful it, it, or people are just and dealing with it right now? incredibly successful. Uh, his poll numbers are high among Republicans, okay, who are the ones who, you know, who would decide <laughs> in, in a primary. I don't know that there are going to be primary challenges as much as we focus on Jeff Flake and his criticism of this president. Guess what? 2018. I'm going to see running. what happens we'll in 2018. See, I mean, yeah, I mean, but we'll I, see. But I mean, I think in some ways he's also just a garden variety Republican. I mean, if you look at his policies, rolling back regulations, lowering taxes, and in that way, anti-abortion guns, they love that. Right. And all the other stuff, it's like, okay, whatever, we'll deal with that for what they, the evangelicals love this. Mm -hmm. And that's the crazy thing. I, I used to think they. White evangelicals, though. Yeah. 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 I mean, you can punctuate that with almost like they're like, why do women vote for Trump? Why did white women vote for Trump? White why married did, women. Why, like it's white like you have women, to. You, you watch these stories and you have to punctuate it with race, or you're wrong. White so, married women voted for him, 51 percent, and then now with this stuff, and it just kind of just piggybacking off of what's happening today with Rob Porter. It was given to me that, and, and I found out it was true, and they answered it. The White House. <laughs> the first day or the first week or something, they defunded or eliminated the Women in Violence Office, the Violence Against Women Office. Mm -hmm. And look at what's happening now. And women came out strongly for him. White women came out strongly for him. And still support him, no? Still, well, I don't know. Let's I take mean, a poll now. I go back to... <laughs> I, I'm so... For me, I feel really happy that I was on the campaign trail for so long because it gives me a window into people's minds. And this... This voter said this thing to me that I think explained for me why what, what, why Donald Trump is where he is right now. This voter said that he voted for Obama in 2008 because he, because he was the flashy new guy, it was amazing. And then when, when 2016 came around, he said the hot hand was in Trump. Oh, Hillary just like was kind of boring. You knew that what you were gonna get with Hillary. With him, he just seemed like a roster. He was talking, he was, he was, he was just a person who was entertaining to watch. And I thought to myself, if that's where we've gotten to, and if you and if we're an apprentice reality TV show society, which I think largely we are, 
if that's the case, then people are you're gonna have to be popular. You're not it's not gonna just be policies anymore. I you're think his have to big brother today. TV, right? I mean, yeah. Donald Trump understood he does. TV. I mean, you think about the first television <laughs> president, JFK, probably, and understood that as a medium, it is a new medium uh, then, and I think Donald Trump understands TV uh, and comes through the screen in a way that Hillary Clinton didn't, in a way that Obama obviously understood the power of TV and the power of pop culture uh, as well in a way that we hadn't seen before. And by Not the only way, oh, TV, God. but he understands the media in general. Yeah. I mean, he reads the New York Times every day, even though he constantly calls them the failing New York Times, right? But that's one of his primary sources of news. And of course, and the Washington paper, Post. And the Washington yes. Post. And it's a paper that he used to read he when does. he was in New yeah. York City, uh, developing his real estate deals and the casinos in Atlantic City and so forth. So he, he knows what he's doing. Well, for you guys, though, covering the White House, um, do you feel isolated in this or, or supported? Um, as a woman of color in this White House press corps? Well, we have each other. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> All four of you. Yeah. <laughs> now, let me, let me say this. Let me say this. I consider each one of these ladies on the stage friends, and I'm going to tell you, Darlene is, I mean, and Sonia used to be there. We had the sister girl moments. Um, you know, if, if, if ever something's going on, we'll text message. She said, are you here? I'm like, yeah, I'm here. I didn't know you were there. We look out for each other. You know, and um, that's a good thing. And Yamiche, you know, we've I'm, I'm so glad that she's she's at the White House now. Um, we need more. We need more of a diverse group of reporters at the White House. Yamiche, um, we've talked on occasion about different things, and we've been there for each other. Yamiche, we during the CBC, we ha we have crazy experiences, all of us together, um, in different things. In in you know, but it's 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 a friendship. And then Nia, I'm gonna say something about Nia. Nia used to work at the White House. And then she didn't, and she moved on. No, 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 no. She didn't. She's she's been climbing higher and higher and higher. And Nia, um, at one of the worst points of my life, stop shaking your head. <laughs> she said, "Girl, what are you doing?" I said, "I'm all right." And we had a conversation. And if it weren't for Nia, well, I was I was in flux at that time, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And my agent and I were talking about things, but Nia made me see clearly. And that clarity landed me at CNN. So that call from me, I said, okay, it's time. Because I was in flux. And, 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 that's, and, and I hate this thing. I'm from Baltimore, and we talk about crabs in the barrel. If you don't know what that means, look it up, <laughs> Google it. But um, I don't like that mentality of, you know, we can't, we all try to help each other in some kind of way. Because it's so few of us. And I don't like that going after one another. And there's some people out there that are not in the, the understanding, but it's about helping one another, and if we can, we can. And we, we help all people, but we know it's a unique situation to be in that White House. It's a unique situation for African Americans to be in that White House, and for women, African American women, to be in government. We, you don't see many blacks going into politics, political, political uh, journalism right. anymore. You don't see a lot of us. And it, it means something when you have that sisterhood or that brotherhood or that coming together to be able to lift one another up. How you doing? Like, it could be something bad. They might snipe at you from the podium or are you going to lunch? It just, it's something about that camaraderie. And, and I mean, if you think about the numbers, I mean, there are, I mean, I sometimes get to counting maybe 10, maybe 20 of us all together. I mean, I don't you even look know at people 20. covering, black people covering national I don't politics even know oh, yeah. in Washington. Washington. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can in broaden Washington. it to national politics. Yeah, I mean, maybe 20. So, I mean, it's a very small it's group. Small and group. the irony is yeah. it's more covering this administration Maybe than others. No, we no, had no, during I the Clinton years, Sonia. How many? It was like twelve. It was Bill Douglas. You, you mean me, in the White Ann House? Globe, yeah, in the White. Uh, uh, Ann Scales. It was uh, Ken Strickland. Um, it was it, we had. It was. It, it was eleven. It was a lot of us. Oh, uh, uh, Wendell Golder, mm -hmm. Jeff Ballou. It was a, during the Clinton years. He was known as the first black president. So I think all the newspapers <laughs> wanted to send black <laughs> folks down there. And, but still, but, I mean, eleven. I mean, it was that's good. Yeah. The, and yeah. Now it's like that's you have the to, record. Yes, like okay, is this one how many okay, because some people say it's only three of us. I'm like, it's a little bit more, but you have to Well, but on any given day when you when you watch the press briefing, if the news organizations are doing it right, the front row could be could entirely African American. Mm -hmm. Could be. There's and if I go down the row, there's 
Kristen Welker from NBC. Mm -hmm. There is Kevin. Kevin Cork from Fox News. You. CBS doesn't really have no. anyone. And you're in the next one. Then there's me. And then, um, was it Aisha? I mean, Ashley? There's oh, Aisha Roscoe. Aisha, Aisha yeah. Roscoe yeah. from Reuters. Reuters. Um, CNN. There's Somebody keep in count? There used to Abby. be. Abby. Abby yeah. from CNN. Abby yeah. from CNN. There Abby. used to be Joe Tolu at Joe Bloomberg. Jones, but it's now Abby. Yeah. yeah. Tolu so, at Bloomberg. Tolu, Tolu he's yeah. in the second but he's on row. second row. Oh, okay. Sorry. But. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm know. on the third. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Smack dab in the middle. And when you gonna, when you gonna move up to the first row? What, what do you have? How many times they do you have to? They are never moving hers. No, they, no, they are definitely not moving her to the first <laughs> row. Not in this administration, baby, but you know, who knows? <laughs> Actually, we'll see her outside of the White House grounds. Um, well, excuse me? <laughs> outside the gate, let me in. <laughs> you know what, and I do have to add, this is a good segue into this, April. This question is specifically for you. Specifically. We are taught as journalists that we never become, I teach my students, we never become part of the story. Girl, <laughs> where shall I start? And you brought up Omarosa, I did not. I didn't bring her up, I didn't bring her up. You mentioned her, her name. When did I bring you it? Oh, Jack? Okay, yeah. whatever. <laughs> okay. And the AP is always right, just so you know. If Darlene says it, I'm like, okay, I did. Okay. Um, um, okay, so. But it um, has worked. It has, it, in some ways, it has worked in your favor. Has it? Mm hmm. Uh, yeah. You don't well, think you don't working think, in my favor? See, and see, this is this is kind of the warped mentality to me, and I'm not saying you're warped, but um, <laughs> no, because no, I can no, I can cut off your mic. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. So look, um, this is this is where I have a problem with it. People think, oh, they see they see you sitting at the desk at CNN and talking, or here, you know, or having a fellowship here at this wonderful institution, GW or writing books and things of that nature. Oh, she's arrived. But guess what behind that? I've got death threats and I'm a divorced mother of two kids. Mm. There's a reality for me. And then, you know, when, when your children's school, your kids are in school and something happens in the briefing room and it goes viral, you know? And my kid, my 15-year-old is in current events class and she has to text me, mommy, are you okay? I said, I'm great <laughs> because she saw are you gonna get the Congressional Black Caucus to have a meeting with me or whatever he said? And then the shaking your head. The school reached out to both of my daughters to make sure they were okay and watched them. There is collateral damage behind this. Mm -hmm. So I take it for what it is, it's a season, but you know, um, I don't want to become the story. I haven't done anything wrong. I have asked questions that anyone else will ask. But because I asked about Russia, and then I got salad dressing, Russian salad dressing, and I won't eat Russian salad dressing anymore because of that comment. I'm serious. Did you I'm, like it before? Not really. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I definitely won't eat it now. Um, but no, I mean, after that, and then, and then the shaking your head thing. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nia, it's the truth. So anyway, and then I'm like, okay. And then, and then the thing with, but all of this stemmed from a certain person who wanted to discredit me because the press is, um, is wrong. We are enemies, we are the opposition party. And it started during the summer of 2016 and it carried over into the White House. And that's in, and I'm writing about it and I really don't wanna get into it too much because it's, it's hard to talk about. But yeah, you know, I, I was prepared for the time, I guess. But you're not gonna knock me down and I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna share this with you. And I did tell Hillary Clinton this. I said, you taught me a lesson. And she said, what? I said, when people called you a name, you didn't say anything, and it stuck. You're not gonna lie on me. Because I grew up, and my, my aunt used to tell me, sometimes Mrs. Obama was right. When they go low, you go high, but sometimes. <laughs> you gotta go low. <laughs> when a bully comes at you, you gotta hit them one good time to let them know <laughs> I'm not the one. And I had to do that. No I'm, no, I'm serious. <laughs> and going back to what I said, for 21 years I've been doing this. I stand on too many shoulders. I've been doing this for 21 years and for somebody to tell a lie on me that I could sue for or continue to lie on me, I could sue for. 
I, I'm a divorced mother of two kids. My whole thing is making sure my kids go to college and we have a roof over our heads. I'm not worrying about all that. I'm not into all that, but I'm now the target. I'm not the one, not today. <laughs> <laughs> So, you mentioned Russia. Um, <laughs> former president, you know, I always looking for a second. I, I right? see. That's the, that's the <laughs> reporter. Very clever. Former President George W. Bush said today, he was at a summit in Abu Dhabi, and he said today that this is a quote, pretty clear evidence that Russia meddled in the presidential election. At the end of the day, when Robert Mueller is done with his investigation, do you think, Darlene, that Trump will be charged with a crime? Mm. I can't answer that question. Um, yeah, you can. <laughs> and I won't. <laughs> um, we don't know. We don't know. What's your best guess? 50-50. Nice. <laughs> Could you be a little more He vague? doesn't act like a man that's innocent. <laughs> really? He doesn't. I mean, why are you going to continue to try to cut off the fire people who are investigating. If, if you have nothing to hide, it should be okay. He, he does not act like a man that's innocent. Mm -hmm. Or this administration doesn't. Take your face. Image? I, I'm with Darlene. I have no idea. Um, yeah. there, no, I mean, no one in Washington knows. Right. Yeah. Robert Mueller, there have been a little bit of leaks, but for the most part, they're running a very tight ship. So there's, no, there's not been one story that I read that said Robert Mueller's leaning this way or leaning that way or he's going to indict someone with the last name Trump. Forget the president, any of the kids, Kushner. Like, there hasn't been one story that's like, it's about to happen right now. And until it actually happens, it's anyone's guess. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think we do know what the Republican reaction will be. I think we, you know, there was all this talk early on, oh, will he get impeached and all that. I think, you know, House Republicans particularly, and that's where impeachment, uh, you know, sort of charges would have to originate. I think we pretty much know that uh, they are going to be in this president's corner because his success uh, is is their success. I think uh, that's one of the things I think there's been the lessons and what they've demonstrated pretty pretty clearly. This Nunes memo, uh, for instance, that they are going to find a way uh, to to protect this president. And, and, and impeaching a president is incredibly hard, and it should be hard. So I mean, I think that's one of the things we learned. But I agree about the Mueller thing. We have no idea. But, but some of the Republicans are, are, you know, they they've shifted. They've but gone very away. Few, they're not right? They're not running for re-election. I mean, it's McCain. It's Flake. I mean, it's a Gowdy, very Porker. Few. Yeah, Gowdy, <laughs> yeah. Porker. Yeah. And the list will probably grow. But that's what I was going to say. Do you think that list will grow? You say they'll stick with him, but for how long? I mean, I mean if their if their yeah. political lives are at stake. I mean, I think they will stick with him because I think Republican voters will largely stick with him. I mean, I think we are in an era of tribalism, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and they, in some ways, Donald Trump was right when he said he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue uh, and he wouldn't lose any followers. I mean, I think they're very loyal to him. Uh, they largely like what he's doing, certainly policy-wise. The economy's doing well, even though the stock market had a terrible day today. Um, and a terrible, terrible week. Yeah. Um, but, but by and large, you know, I think if you look at polls, Republicans are with this president. I also think that um, we know what Republicans might do because Robert Mueller, even though he's a Republican, has somehow become almost an enemy. If you watch Fox News and you talk to some Republicans on the Hill, they're starting this, they've, they've kind of started this, this smear campaign to say that he's going to be leaning this way or that way because of his political beliefs. So even when we go back to that vanguard versus new Republican, they're almost they're almost painting him as like he's a he's a Republican, but like it's it's an old school Republican who doesn't want to see Trump be successful. What do you guys as as African American female journalists, what do you think is the what is the the toughest part of covering this White House? Being a target. Why do you think you're a target? I'm not the base. I mean, the Twitterverse that supports them, just why is she in there to take her credentials, you know? I mean, you know, they, they don't understand that there has been, it, and going back to what Nia said, there's tribalism or, or Yamish, whoever said it. There's tribalism, and I think if you look at stories, people see it different ways. People are looking at it in a different way than, than I may be seeing it. And I think people are not able to see it too because of 
partisan politics. I mean, I was chastised for asking the question about, do you support, are you, did you support slavery or something because of what General Kelly said about the compromise about the Confederacy and, and the Civil War. And if the compromise happened, we wouldn't be on the stage. We'd be slaves. So, and then and they were calling Robert E. Lee um, honorable, honorable. So, and it, it, it again, it, that's not long after Charlottesville, not long after trying to, 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 to mess with Frederica Wilson or, or go attacking Frederica Wilson. This one thing they do well is targeting people. They do it very well. And um, I'm waiting to see, going back to Amorosa, I'm waiting to see how they're going to target her now since they came out the podium talking about she was fired three times on The Apprentice and then we fired her, you know. They are very good at targeting people. So I think, and it's hard sometimes to do your job, but if you know, if you can go home at the end of the day and say, I did what I was supposed to do. I did everything that a white reporter would do or any other reporter would do. I can go to sleep peacefully and have an eight hour rest and get up and come back and do it again the next day. Mm -hmm. The targeting is hard. One of the hardest things and this is not specifically to being a black woman, I think we all have experienced this one, but it's just sometimes just trying to get answers to questions. Mm. And sometimes it's very basic questions. Um, is the president going somewhere? Um, I'm trying to think of a recent example. It's not anything that you're asking that is super duper complicated or uh, when is Rob Porter top leaving? Top secret, right. When is Rob <laughs> Porter leaving? That's true. And for example, today we came in and there had been some reports on TV that, well, yesterday they said he was going to, he was, he submitted his resignation, they accepted it, and he was going to stay on through a transition period. Then we came in this morning and there were a lot of reports on television that said he was out immediately. And we tried all day to get someone to say, well, is he gone? Has he left? Has he worked his last day at the White House? And nobody would say anything but did until you see the briefing, yeah. which was originally scheduled for 1 p.m. Yeah. Then it got pushed to 2.30 p.m. We were all sitting out there waiting. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it was, I think it was after a little bit after 2.30. Then they announced on the overhead speaker the briefing is now pushed until 3.15. 3 yeah. And it didn't start until almost 4 o'clock. Right. But the question, I have a question. By that time, he was like on a train. But remember the video, <laughs> remember the video everyone was showing yesterday and he was walking with the two people. Whenever someone resigns or is terminated, mm -hmm. they're escorted out. I'm wondering if that was the escort out. You remember the video? I think that was just okay. footage. Okay. Yeah, because they said walk. that. They said that he came into work today and then was basically packed his stuff up and left. Mm -hmm. yeah. I heard him. I heard what they said, but I saw a picture too. A video. I didn't, I mean, has any, I don't think there was any video of him today. Yeah, I don't so, I mean, so. I, no. completely be. Because. Not that I know about. But no, this was from yesterday. I was wondering if. That's what I'm saying. Like, there's no video of him today, so yeah, it wouldn't be out of the finished. realm of possibilities that he was gone since last night. Okay. So, and I know about spin, right? But on the basic questions, like when's Rob. Like alternative Porter, facts. <laughs> <laughs> when's he leaving? Um, do you guys get stories that, do you think you, do, do you get stories that you're white? counterparts wouldn't because you're women of color? Or is it the opposite? <laughs> they don't give me stories. They give me grief. Out. Yeah. But I find out from the outside and I push it on the inside. <laughs> I get my stuff from the outside and just ask them on the inside. And they're like, how did she find out about that? <laughs> I've got sources. <laughs> Good sources, too. I, I think... Um, covering after I covered Ferguson, and there were there were people who let me in their homes in Missouri. I think mainly because I was a black woman asking questions, and I and I could tell them my brother is someone who's an African American man who's had issues with the police. I can tell them I've been stopped by the police because someone thought I was a black man because my hair was too long and I was driving my brother's car. So I think that people tell you things for different reasons, but I also think that. As reporters, for the most part, you try to endear yourself to people for any reason. I've been in the homes of white people who told me point blank, oh, I don't think black people like to work. They still gave me my iced tea. I still didn't drink it, but I, I sat on the couch. <laughs> and, and, you know, but the thing is, like, if you are a human being, I've found that if you're a human being to somebody, then they'll give it to you. The, but having covered politics now for only, like, two years, 
I think there are the people give you things. People don't give you things for reasons too. So if I'm covering the Hill, if I'm a young white guy, is the senator's office more likely to, to, to give me information because I'm going to be sitting at the bar where I'm frequenting, frequenting the same bars as them, or I went to the same school, or I'm in the same sorority. I'm an AKA too. So I'm not going to have a sorority connection to any white woman unless you pledged Alpha Kappa Alpha. So uh, there's that's, that's a dirty word on this campus. What? Alpha anything right about now. <laughs> Whatever. So to me, there's these, later. <laughs> so there's this human connection that you make with people that you. I, so I think that if you're a white woman walking around and you're and you're from the same sorority as, as someone like maybe Hope Hicks or whatever. I don't know if she's in sorority, but the idea is that like the connections that you make is why you get different stories. Yeah. And I don't know the stories that I'm not getting, but you know the the hill or the white house is majority white so i don't know if they look at me and they're like we're not going to tell her what our plans are for haiti because she's asian they might say that they might look at someone else and say well we think that this person's going to spin it because of this or they might think the opposite they might want to leak something to yeah, and, april because right. they're like well if we give it to the black reporter and the, and the the unemployment number story to her maybe it'll it'll make us look like we're extra in, concerned about this is that or racist it, is that racist Oh, God. I don't know. It, it's not racist. It's about what they want to do and who they want to attract for that moment. Yeah. It's, it's always strategically Strategic. placed. Because you would, I mean, for instance, when it was Black History Month, I mean, it, or, or when you were going, I remember you had an interview with Obama at some point when you, when I, I had think a lot for the of anniversary. With Obama. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think a lot of times it is about outlets, right? I mean, maybe outlets, they want the something. And it's outlets also reach, their base. They're kind of targeting. Yeah, yeah I mean, Obama yeah. would go on black radio a lot when he was trying to sell, uh, get people to sign up. Well, uh, wait a minute. For, for I Obama want an interview or, with this president. I still, I, yeah. I've been actively, I've asked on Twitter, I've asked Sarah Huckabee, I've asked everywhere. I want to interview with this president. Yeah. I definitely do. I want to talk about all the issues and race, because I want to hear it and see it from him. Did what you tweet him directly? Yes, I did. Okay. Did he respond? I did it on the camp when he was he campaigning. No, he never responded. Um, I did it on the campaign trail. I did it while he's president. I want an interview with him. And this is not about race. This is about the president of the United States of America. And I want to be there when you get that interview with him. Too. <laughs> I don't know. It might be too many of us in the room at the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, this goes back. So, so Yamich, you, as everybody now knows, you're from ha your parents are, Haitian. are Haitian. My dad's um, there, You're yeah. Haitian, and your parents, and I hope you don't strangle me for saying this, are physicians. No, they're doctors. So my oh, dad, do doctorate. Well, you're the PhDs. Yeah, PhDs. They're educated. Okay. My mom has two. <laughs> they're educated. So how, how sure. did you, how did you not let Trump's derogatory comment about your country affect mm. um, how you covered the issue? I think, well, the phone, okay, so there, it's kind of an anecdote. So I was switching jobs. I was leaving the New York Times and I was going to start at PBS. So I had a week off. I have two jobs because immigrants work hard. <laughs> and <laughs> so I also, so I, so I also work for MSNBC and, um, and, and NBC News. So I am taking the week off. I was like, oh, I'm not going to do any hits. I'm in Ohio visiting my fiance. And the, the, he says these comments. I get a call from my aunt who's crying. She's like, I can't believe he would say this about me and say this about us after he said this, so after he said what he said about AIDS, because Haitians have gone through a lot in this country. The AIDS, the AIDS rumor, a lot of people were like, well, why is he saying Haitians have AIDS? There was a time where people wouldn't even let Haitians give blood. Your kids were getting bullied in school. My, those are my cousins. My mom was being told, I don't want you to, I don't want to share the, the lunch room with you because I think you have AIDS. That happened to people that are related to me. So there's a real deep history. So you don't just say, oh, they have AIDS and it's like a thing. It's like people's lived experiences are that they had to protest in the street because the United States was saying that Haitians were the reason why AIDS exists in the United States. So all that was happening and I was like, I'm off of work, okay? Like, I'm, I'm not trying to do this. My mother calls me and said, so you're, you're reporting, right? Like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm off this week. And she's like, so? <laughs> <laughs> so then I'm like, all right, fine. So I was like, okay, well, what can I, so MSNBC, so I started tweeting, just saying like, here's what I'm hearing, here's what's going on. And then I said, well, who, why would, I would call the Haitian ambassador. And they, I'm sourced up with him because I'm Haitian, I guess, and I'm a reporter. So I've always like gone back to interview him or talk to him. I'm always interested in what the Haitian embassy is doing, and they've been doing a lot in the recent years. So I talked to him and got, and got some actual news, which is that hey, the Haitian government had formally asked the United States to explain themselves. 
so that I started just tweeting out because again I have no I, had, I don't work anywhere so I'm just tweeting out my notes saying this is what I heard this is what I heard Rachel Maddow calls me and says okay can you come on so I come on and I have to take deep breaths when I come on because I speak quickly naturally like I was trying to slow myself down so I always so I had to take so many I was like doing yoga in the studio <laughs> because I wanted to make sure I was clear I was precise and people didn't think that I was just ranting because I had reporting that I wanted to tell people I had facts about Savannah that I wanted to tell people. I had facts about my own parents and, ha and my mom who has two PhDs. I had real facts that I wanted to give. So I just focused on that. I focused on what do you actually want to tell people? Because you could get any Haitian person to spew about how angry they are. But for me, it was like I, I interviewed people. So whenever I feel like I'm upset or I'm about to cry about something, I try to report those things. So, and every time that happens to me, I feel like I'm I'm at my best when I'm doing that. I'm usually breaking stories or I'm having stories on the front page because I'm so, so emotionally invested in something that to, to counterbalance how angry I am, I'm reporting out facts that make people say, okay, this is why people are angry. Okay, I have one last, one final question. <laughs> one last question and then I wanna open it up to you guys. If you have a question, if you would please go to the center of the auditorium, there's a microphone there. This is being recorded. I guess we should have told you that up front. Um, <laughs> so my final question for each of you is, if you were writing a play or a musical about covering oh. the Trump administration, what would it be called? A hot mess. Ooh. <laughs> I'll say this, I, I, mean, I think partly because this is a White House that thrives on chaos. And I think it, it, covering it, sometimes you feel like a hot mess covering it. I mean, because there's so many uh, big and unexpected stories that happen, right? I mean, if you think about last week, we were, I think it was last week, it was the State of the Union, right? Mm. And typically, I mean, that's a very routine thing that happens. And the White House goes, uh, you know, on, on tour and goes to different communities. Uh, and, and talks about the State of the Union, but that was a, a blip, right? And so I think all of us have had to reorient the way in which we uh, uh, cover this White House. And I think in some ways it's made a hot mess of our personal lives. Uh, and I think it, it's worked for him in terms of his strategy, and he sort of likes it that way, right? I mean, I think he thrives on uh, chaos. I mean, he's the reality TV guy, and I think that's in some ways the kind of White House uh, he's, he's, he's had. On the other hand, I think in some ways it's been very effective in terms of getting the policies that he wants uh, through Congress. Maybe he's not as well read in terms of those policies, uh, but I think he's done well in terms of getting those through and uh, doing what he wants to do. Well, he certainly gets the media attention. Yeah. <laughs> and the ink. Yeah, Mitch? Um, I was gonna go with chaos, but I think I'm gonna go with America. Because as because my parents are from outside the country, um, or my dad still lives, or my mom lives in Miami, they watch international news a lot. And I think that when we th we think that this is all crazy, but it's very much America's story. America's story is that we have a lot of race issues. America's story is that everybody probably knows somebody that's like Donald Trump or has spoken like Donald Trump. Everyone knows that there might have been somebody who was super educated, an African American, who got a great job, and then there was a counterpart that maybe didn't do the same things, but got the same job. Everyone's had that experience where one, where you might have a coworker that can say crazy things all day, and somehow everyone thinks that they're great and that they're cute, and then you can have a, 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 somebody who works hard but says very little and tries to just get it done, and that person is seen as problematic or the moment that they raise their voice, they're angry, they're critical. So I think in, in, in the idea that your father could give you a lot of privilege and that America is built on this idea that we, we question whether or not affirmative action is something that's good, but we don't ever talk about the fact that Georgetown and other places, one, had to say, sell slaves to build the building and to have the building to begin with, and then two, your parents, or there are people that are my age, your parents might have gone to Georgetown at a time where my mom was legally barred from going there. So, but somehow you're, they call it, I forgot what it's called, and when you, when you have it the other way, but it's like loyalty or whatever, it's, it's called legacy. legacy. You have legacy, and legacy is seen as something that's so, it's normal because it's, you know, that's what your parents, you, it's what you get if you went to an alma mater, but affirmative action is this evil thing that, that hurts people. So I think America is a great way to think about this presidency because the Apprentice, reality TV, social media, our country's changed. We are not someone who, we are not interested in, in politically 
and, and politically correct people, I think, at this point, point in, our, in our country. Darlene? I was going to go with Never a Dull Moment, but I just recently changed to a new title. My book would be called OMG. <laughs> <laughs> the story of Donald Trump's presidency or something like that would be the subtitle. And i going with the second title because this goes back to a year ago in May. My colleagues and I, we were sitting in our booth in the White House, and uh, we were waiting for something to come from the press office. Finally, it comes into the inbox. I open the email, and I said, oh my god, he just fired Jim Comey. <laughs> and the year and, what is it, a month and six weeks that we're into now, it's just been filled with moments, a lot of OMG moments. Um, and I think a lot of us thought in year two that year two might have begun a little differently, might have been a little calmer or more stable, but it's, it hasn't. It hasn't started that way. It could be OMG, never a dull moment. OK. <laughs> <laughs> April? So my real book that's coming out in September is called Under Fire, dot, dot, dot. And then. Oh, was that just a plug? <laughs> it was. <laughs> well, I mean, but OK, no, well, anyway. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> OMG, <laughs> was that just a plug? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so, 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 okay, so, but if I had it to do um, for, for this moment, there are two words that come to mind. One, fake, and then the other one is un-American. Un-American. Un because um, un-American, you know why fake, you know, we're supposed to be fake, nothing fake up here. Um, but when you go to Un-American, that was a poignant moment in Cincinnati when this president said um, that the people who sat down and didn't clap were Un-American. We've seen this over the years after, at every State of the Union address. One party sits down when they don't like something while the other stands up. And I remember a time when there was one person from an opposite party, an opposing party, when President Obama was in the well of the house, said, you lie. Yeah. Yeah. And, and no one said a word about treasonous or, or, or un-American. They said decorum. That was the word, decorum. So I guess I'm perceived as unpatriotic and un-American. I think the press is, too, because you know we're in the First Amendment, but I think a lot of people haven't read the Constitution. So I think that un-American, but it's, it's just the exact opposite. The book or the play would be to prove how American and patriotic we are because we love this country and we stand firm, cloaked in the First Amendment, freedom of the press. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Hello. Can you take questions? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, okay, we cool. can hear you. Thank you, ladies, for coming out. I really enjoyed it. I guess my question is, Say America, I guess, or the people who don't, you know, like Trump, if he is impeached scenario and he has to step down and Pence was to become president, I'm curious to know, what do you think a Pence administration would look like? I think he would be effective and would get things done and would be way less, and would be way quieter, um, but the country would probably change more. He understands how government oh, works. Yeah, less tweeting. Yeah, and he understands how he government works. He has governance, works. yeah. He understands I, but I think he has relationships where people would trust him when he says, I need you to vote for this, I need you to defund Planned Parenthood, I need you to do these things, I think he, he would be able to get those things done in a way that Trump can't. Because there's a, a section of Republicans that are like, am I gonna stake my, my reputation on this guy? And then he's gonna turn around next week and say, well, I can't believe they, unfun they, un they uh, um, unfunded Planned Parenthood. I would never have done that. I didn't realize all the things that they did. That, that senator so-and-so was so terrible when he told me to do this. It would certainly be less dramatic. Um, huh. But the vice president is, as Yamish said, more conservative. So the country would continue to change and go down this more conservative path, but just with less drama and chaos. Yeah, I mean, I think he is an ideological center uh, in knowledge of policy and is a rock rib conservative in the way that Trump just isn't. So I, I think it would be, I mean, in some ways, as I said before, I think Trump is a standard issue Republican. Uh, in some ways, but I think for Pence, it would be even even more that that. But you know, but I think, you think we're getting way guess, ahead of ourselves. Sorry. No question. Thank you. Uh, good evening, um, Professor Thompson. Asked you earlier, you know, if you feel supported by your colleagues in the White House poll. But you know, in the moments when you're 
you actually become the new story how what do you end up doing when you you know your editor or your producer or your employer actually pulls you aside and do they support you i mean in those moments all right thank you for that question um i guess it's my, do y'all want to answer okay because um, <laughs> they've never become part well, of the I story. Well, let I me say this. Let me say this. Um, no, the great thing about it, and everyone up here knows I'm a talker. Really? So. so Breaking news. <laughs> break news. Break. All right. Anyway, so um, one thing that's, that, that, that has been great is that I talk to my bosses, and I have always talked to my bosses, and they've known from day one when things happened and it wasn't like a shock. It was not a shock. So when they got a call from a certain person who I shall not name, to basically, to basically say fire me after we had an altercation um, in the White House, my boss said, let me stop you right here. We know everything that's been going on for, from day one. If you're truly friends, you'll go out and have drinks. And that person said, oh, the boss doesn't want us to drink. So. My, my company has been 2,000% behind me. They stand with me. They see, they watch the briefings. We talk constantly. They know what's going on. Um, and, and they check. They know what's going on. So they, they have been behind me. I mean, just, they've just given me so much support. So I'm, I'm good. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, uh, thank you for the very wonderful, interesting conversation. Um, one of the things I was wondering is with the kind of the rise of the term fake news and alternative facts, um, in your day-to-day -day reporting, how often do you see the administration or President Trump himself um, kind of call reporting by people of color, uh, you know, more often being fake news or less credible than reporting by white journalists? And furthermore, when you have to kind of disprove that or prove that your reporting is just as credible, um, you know, more than just kind of digging, you know, through more facts, what do you do to kind of prove your reporting is more credible when they question it? Um, well, the president has called, if, if he calls the, the news media fake, we all take that. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, we all take that. But Sarah, Sarah um, Huckabee Sanders did say to me on Twitter that I'm fake news. And I was like, mm -mm, no, 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 no. But, um, <laughs> and we, we, we've had dinner. We've talked, we've tried to have a coming together, not a coming together, but an understanding of one another. Um, there is a situation where they don't understand why I ask things, but it's, everything comes to the White House from war to peace and everything in between. And race is that in between. And I'm allowed to ask that. But you have a new wave of people coming in who have one point of view and they see things differently. But when I report, and, and it's, I think the onus is on the reader, the listener, or the viewer to really now, because the line has been obscured between fact and opinion, to really take a look at what the person is saying. If, if I say this is from such and such and such and such, I give you documentation, like I gave you the definition of the NAACP. When I ask my questions now, I try to preface them because people like to say, oh, you're fake, you're not. No, because if, if I just told you why I asked the president, is he a racist? And didn't I give you the definition from the NAACP, okay? Um, Today, Rob Portman, they were talking about the president was so, um, he's so incensed and he's upset about, you know, the spot. Huh? Saddened. Saddened. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's AP. I love it. Sad, he's saddened by, you know, this violence against women. So I asked, so if he's so saddened about violence against women, why did he close down or, or defund the, the violence against women office? and also shut down the women and girls office. So that's real stuff, and they could not deny it. So the only way that I can, I don't care if you think I'm not trustworthy or whatever, but what I tell you, what I put out there, it's fact, and, and you can look it up. So that's the only way, just keep doing the who's, what's, when's, where's, and why's, and make sure it's fact-based, fact, fact -based. not opinion. I'm not giving you, well, up here we've given our opinion, but. I'm giving you, when I'm talking to you over there, I'm giving you the facts that I've seen and that I know. Yeah, and I don't think Trump and, and his allies make a distinction in terms of fake news. I think fake news to them is news that they don't like, right? right. It's not yeah. generalized. Right, it's, it's generalized. Not, it's yeah. not like the black reporter or the Latino reporter. It's just mm -hmm. if they don't like it, it's fake news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, uh, thank you all for being here tonight. It really means a lot. Um, I want to know what is something that you wish that you wish you knew going into your profession now that you know now. Everything works out, right? I mean, I didn't necessarily have a plan. I started in print. I was kind of a late bloomer. I went to grad school a bunch before I ended up. Um, going into journalism. So yeah, I mean, I think that's it. And also be nice to everyone, because oh, a lot no. of the people we end up working with, who end up we end up hiring or getting hired by. Or we uh, need you, them to come on panels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you meet them on the campaign trail. And I mean, all of us, you know, go back to 2008 with, 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 with April covering uh, Obama. So it's such a small knit community, if you're a national political reporter covering the White House or the Hill, uh, that those relationships are really important. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank you guys for, for coming to this panel. And I, I had a question for each one of you guys. Um, so like at the end of your career, like when you're in like retirement age, uh, what is one thing that you want? Oh, nah, not like that. But <laughs> uh, what is one thing that you want to be like remembered by as a person and as a journalist? This is an obituary question. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. Or what drives you guys? Yeah. I mean, I think mentoring. That's one of the things I try to do with the folks in the younger, particularly women, particularly black people in the newsroom uh, at, at CNN and other newsrooms I've been in. Because I just think it's important. We've got this next generation. We're not going to be in these roles uh, forever uh, to be generous to folks who are coming up behind us. Because in a lot of ways, I didn't necessarily have a lot of mentors. Gwen Ifill was one of oh, them. Gosh. And we should mention yeah. her, the late, great, amazing Gwen Ifill. Yes. You're, of course, now at, at PBS News. And she was one of my mentors and someone I, who was my role model and looked up to and wanted to be. Um, so I think that's one of the things for me, just bringing up the next generation and mentoring and pouring into folks who are coming up behind you. I hope that people say, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I just hope that people say I told the truth and that I made a difference and yeah. that I really represented everyday people's um, concerns and challenges. I really hope that what, if, I'm, if I die, because <laughs> that's clearly what it's going to be, because <laughs> like, like, um, I don't plan on retiring, hopefully not. Um, <laughs> I think that that's what it is. I think I hope that I can be remembered as a civil rights journalist and that the, the body of work that I leave behind is not just like hodgepodge of all sorts of, of cool and interesting things that I've been able to do, but that people can thread together the stories that I wrote and say she was a 2018 civil rights journalist. I think that I would like to be remembered as someone who worked hard, tried to do my best every day, um, you know, put everything into whatever story I was working on at that moment. Um, I think I would also like to be, at that time, I would hope that there would be some other woman of color who would come behind me and work for the AP and get to cover the White House, because right now there have only been two. Right, Sonia? You and me? Three? Two? And how long has the AP been around? Um, yeah. Since 1846, yeah. right? Um, yes. That's another panel. <laughs> April? April. Um, yeah, what would I, mentoring. Um, also, making, exposing truth. Um, putting fact out there. Making sure that people really understood the truth about communities that um, were underserved. And also, my heart in trying to cover these presidents, four presidents. I hope I get to cover five and six presidents. You know, who knows? But um, you know, I kind of I wouldn't mind being considered the next Helen Thomas. You know, as far as longevity, um, no one can be Helen. But also, then you get the front row. But I don't know if I want the front row. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but I also want the heart and the respect of both Helen and Gwen Ifill. Mm -hmm. Those were some wonderful, trailblazing women whose shoes can never be filled. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi. I just think that you all are great. Welcome, Soros. Um, I'd just like to ask you, I probably, like a lot of other people, 
have not paid as much attention to the news as I have since this election and this administration. Good self-care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we need to support a therapy group, not to a watch. But for whether you like him or not, the reality is that a lot of people are exposed to you and know you by names and would know you if we see you in the grocery stores because we're so attuned to the news. Um, you've in various ways become celebrities, whether intentionally or not, just because the criticism that is sometimes directed at you directly, in your case, um, Ms. Ryan, from the White House. What, if anything, can you find that is positive about the coverage that you have had to do in terms of um, how has it affected you as a journalist? Or is there something positive that you could take away from this entire experience? I mean, everything, I think. I mean, I, this is a privilege and an opportunity to cover uh, an administration, cover the country, to talk to people uh, about how they feel about this, uh, go into their homes. So, yeah, I mean, I am delighted to be in this role. I feel lucky uh, to be covering this administration. Uh, there are not that many people, certainly not that many black women, black people, uh, who get to sit in these chairs. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's an honor and a privilege, the job that I have. I think it's it's let me meet people face to face that are not just my mom who I who I can think of that are watching me. I think I try not to think about how many people are watching like PBS NewsHour or MSNBC when I'm on because I like throw up. And so I just think of my mother and think, okay, what my, my mother wants me to slow down. My mom wants me to look decent today. And, and but I think that I don't. I didn't realize how many African Americans, frankly would walk up to me and say, I'm so happy that you're on MSNBC. I'm so happy for your PBS NewsHour job. I'm so happy that, I, that, you can, that you can be in my living room. One of the things when I was leaving the Times and coming to PBS, everyone was like, oh my god, what are you doing? And I thought to myself, I started getting all these emails that were like, oh my god, I get to see you every night. You're going to be my home. And I, I'd never thought about that because I was a print journalist. And you think like people pick up their paper or you're on the train. But there's something about being in people's homes and, and being in people's homes that PBS stations reach, that's different. Um, that, and that, that reminds people, that, that can, I can tell people when the whole Haitian thing happened, you know, you're watching a Haitian reporter working right now. Just the presence of being on TV um, affects the, the conversation and it helps people feel like they're being represented in a way that I never really thought about. Thank you. Last two questions. Uh, I'm sorry, April wanted to answer? Did you want I did not thought oh. Darlene was going to... Oh, so, Darlene, well, you are tied. Darlene's like following no. a story. She is. <laughs> you know, the AP is quick, too. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, I would just say, um, piggyback off of what Nia said, there is a saying, it's kind of a cliche, but it's very true, that we all have a front row seat to history mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And literally every day when we go into the White House, there's something, some history is happening. Yeah. Um, and there are very few people who get to be there every day, and we are all privileged to be among that, that small group. The other thing I would say is that some of the challenges that we've all, we're all facing in terms of covering this, this administration, I think has made us all kind of um, redouble our efforts to you know, make sure our facts are straight, to do mm -hmm. the best job we can, because this climate right now is so hyper-partisan, toxic, there's all this talk about fake news, and you, wanna, you don't want to give anyone any ammunition to come at you. Um, for a kid from Baltimore, who grew up in Baltimore, still lives in the community, um, five generations removed from the last known slave in my family on my mother's side, um, it is a blessing to cover history, to have four American presidents call me by name. This last one, he may call me some other names, but, <laughs> but no, but it's, it's been a blessing. And um, to be able to watch history and to report on history and for people to, to know that when I come to you, I'm telling you the truth. And, and understanding that maybe the reason why I'm being targeted is because I'm effective and they don't like that. So it's been a blessing. You can never dream what the Lord has for you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, my name is Juliet Adams. And are you? Yes, yeah, I yes. Hear you. Yeah. Okay, my name is Juliet Adams, and I have a different perspective. Um, I think the chaos is good because Americans have been silent for too long. It has come in a way that individuals didn't expect. 
So my question to you is that we have heroes and powers from, from old that we need to draw on and send a statement. How was you as the press even the entertainment industry, how are you maximizing on this experience? Well, let me, let me say this to you, and I'm glad you said that. Um, I had a conversation, I'm going to Yamish, like she goes into people's houses. Well, I've gone into somebody's house too. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, icon activist before he became an entertainer, Harry Belafonte invited me to his home. He said, let's have dinner, but I didn't have time, we had tea. And this was between... Um, you drank the tea. I drank his tea. Yes, I did. Yes, I did drink his tea. Um, <laughs> so, this, was, this was right after the election. And I had been watching Facebook. And, and when a lot of people were like in the fetal position for months, that night, you remember the moment when Barack Obama was named president. And you remember the moment when Donald J. Trump was named president. But I, wa I went straight to Twitter. And I mean, I saw Chris Darden, a dear friend of mine, the, the former prosecutor in the O.J. Simpson trial. He said, the black Republican said, oh, they've let uh, the, 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 the town clown have the keys to the White House. I said, ooh, Chris, you're going to get in trouble. And then we hear Bob Johnson, another friend, who says, you know, we have to find common ground. So I called Kwaisi and Fume, um, my former congressman. You should be name dropping through this whole thing. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then no, Bill Clinton not. had me over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he did not. Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> no, no, no. But I'm saying this so she, she's asking about the people, and I'm giving her the people. So I ask, I call Kwaisi and Fume, who used to be the head of the NAACP. And, and while we're here, I want to recognize the former chair of the NAACP, Roz Brock, stand up, raise your hand. Oh, she has just taken over this thing. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. All right, come on now. So come I saw her when she walked in. So anyway, <laughs> um, and that was a name drop, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. But no, he said, I said, I gave him all the scenarios. I said, you know, what's going on? He said, both men are right. He said, we're at a crossroads. So people were still in fetal position weeks later. This was before inauguration, after uh, the election, and people were still having fits. So I go, when I go to New York and sit with Harry Belafonte, he said, I said, sir, what are we seeing? Because he was an activist. He marched with Dr. King, laid on pallets in the homes of these, these, uh, these, these mothers who, who fed them maters and tomatoes from the garden when they were going out to march for Selma and, 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 and the Civil Rights Act and, and for, for the Voting Rights Act and all that kind of stuff. He said, look, he said, when I was under the tutelage, of people like Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois, Du Bois told me something. He said, this is the greatest time ever. I said, why? Why would you say that? He said, because when there's great pain, and this is what du, uh, du Bois told him, he said, when there's great pain, there's activism, radical activism that effectuates change. But the question is, where is that activism? People are talking about it. People will get up on Twitter and do this. Mm, you know, I'm upset. Mm, take that. Behind an emoji. <laughs> Behind an emoji, like you're doing something. All somebody has to do is block you. <laughs> but people are not willing. I, I, I'm not seeing, as reporters, I'm not seeing, you know, we might see the women go out the day after, the next day after inauguration. But I haven't seen, in, in, in a year later, but I'm not seeing the groundswell that, that, that um, Harry Belafonte was talking about. And he's kind of, he was, when I talked to him again, he was kind of upset about that. Because people talk about this dis-ease on Twitter but I'm not seeing people scuff up those red bottoms on the street. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a reporter, I'm not seeing that. So I, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I get where you're coming from. So I see what you're saying, but if you're really upset, and we would, we would love to give us something to report on. We would report on it. But I'm not seeing it to report. I don't see people coming to the White House. Remember how they used to come to the White House? And Jesse Jackson used to be like, during the Reagan years, let me in mm -hmm. with the tin can. You know, scraping it up against the, the wrought iron fence. I don't see that even in Lafayette Park like it used to be. Because they'll shoot you. <laughs> no, no, you can get a permit. Yeah, you can. You well, can. But, and I, I also think it's important to note that, you know, people greeted Obama's presidency uh, with cheers and, and they loved him as president. And it's the same for Donald Trump's presidency, right? But what about I mean, that the majority that are against him? You don't see that. When I he talks about the immigration stuff, when he talks about Charleston, I'm not seeing it. Well, but you had the protests, the weekend, the travel ban, 
was put in place. That was a ground swell. That was a ground swell. All these people couldn't come into the country. You had people at airports protesting But not on the their persistence behalf. and consistency. That's what I'm really talking about. You had about. the Women's March. Yeah, but it's not persistent. It's not. They did it two years running. Yeah. yeah. It's, but yeah, but it, uh, continuously. I'm not, so you I'm don't think it's, as, I'm not it's as persistent them. as the Tea Party, for instance. Right. Yeah. Was and, and, that's, and that's something that he yeah. brought up as well. Harry Belafonte said the resources are some of the problem. He said the Republicans are funded by um, the Koch brothers and different organizations and the NRA and things of that nature, whereas the liberals have a hard time finding the resources. But the, but the liberal, yeah, liberals, I think, I think... Not as, much, not as much as but the But I, I do think there, is an organ, there was an organizing principle around the Tea Party mm -hmm. uh, in a way that there is isn't necessarily that around progressives, right? I mean, right. I think yeah. for progressives, the diversity of their coalition sometimes makes organizing hard. I mean, it's essentially African Americans, it's Latinos, it's uh, college-educated white people, and, and, and women, and those people feel very differently about issues sometimes. But young I think people have led thing. movements around the yeah. nation that have changed, made change. Think about it. I mean, the four kids that sat in at the Woolworths counter. 17 and 18 years old, and they changed the whole dynamic. They started a lot of the ball rolling, part of the ball rolling in the civil rights movement. Dr. King was a young man, and he only had 4% of black churches that supported him at the time. So, I mean, that's, that's fact. But, I mean, the Tea Party was a movement and they affected change. I'm talking about on the other side. I'm talking about on the other side. But there is an other I mean, side. I, hear you. I also yeah. think there's this, you asked about what, as journalists, I think that this is a big moment. I'm, as someone who's, I would say, just starting my career, I talk to a lot of my mentors and say, well, what would you do? I mean, I don't even, I don't even try to say Gwen Ifill's name that much because it, it's so upsetting to me mm. that I'm working at PBS and she's not there. They still have Gwen's office, kind of, they still call it that. Mm. So to me, it's like, I just have to constantly tell myself that I talked to Gwen before she died, that, I, that she told me that I could do these jobs, that she told me that I could do this. I think about, and I'm kind of in this place now where I'm like, okay, what am I, at? Who, do, who do I have? Who am I gonna talk to? Because for me, it's like, I, there is this feeling where I'm like, I have to step up as a journalist. And the person, the, per, the main person that I would be asking questions to isn't here. But I find myself asking questions to other journalists because I'm still, I would say I'm still very new. And I'm definitely a street reporter. Like, I'm a reporter who, for until, two, until like a year and a half ago, I was a backpack, sneakers kind of reporter all the time. And I still do that now. But there's also like the politics of it and trying to wrap my head around how I, how you look for policy to explain what's happening on the street is probably the more the more poignant reporting right now because of what's going on in the White House. But it's it's a tough thing to wrap your head around. Yeah. We're gonna have to go to the, we, was that your yeah. thought? Um, thank, thank you. you. And the final question belongs to you. Hi, thank you so much for coming. And um, so you're all obviously very established in your um, careers. So advice to young media, uh, especially journalists. Um, you have to be aware of everything that's happening all the time in this field. And so how do you maintain your mental health hmm. um, throughout do this? Do we? I don't know. How do, you um, what does she mean? Yeah. how do we maintain our mental health? Well, <laughs> it's gonna do I mean, I, I'll say for me, yeah. um, <laughs> I have always want, I've always had a balance. My mom's a school social worker. So she always was someone who was very, very good at balancing stress. When I was stressed out in, in college one year, I was like, like, just like very stressed out. And she was like, um, you need to start watching Grey's Anatomy. And <laughs> that was so stressful. I find it very stressful. It changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it's really about, my mom has like the summers off because she's a school social worker. She was like, because I wanted to hang out with my kids and I wanted to go on trips with my children because I wanted you guys to know that, that you were the most important thing to me. Mm -hmm. So there's this idea that I was raised by someone who was very, um, precise about how she set up her life. And I'm doing that now. I'm about to get married in three weeks. And for me, for me, for me, it made sense to want to make room in my life for a boy that had been like calling me for an, a year, right? <laughs> it made sense for me to be like, maybe I should go on a date. Maybe I should just like see what this love thing is about. Like, I think that there's, that you have to make room in your life for other things. And you have to have, even if it's very hard to disconnect, because I'm, I get Donald Trump's tweets as text messages. Mm -hmm. The point is that that at some point, even if it's for 30 minutes or an hour, I'm at the gym or I'm running, I work out, or I'm mainly because I want to get in a dress, not for mental health, but <laughs> whatever. So, but I, I, I fill my time with Netflix and other things. But I feel like you have to give yourself an hour where you're just like 
chilling out. Yeah, and, because, and, and I think you have to learn to say no, mm, right? I yeah. mean, that was a big thing. When I started at, at CNN, that's one of the things that John King mm -hmm. told me in my first week there, basically learn how to say no, which is very hard uh, at CNN, because CNN is the kind of place you, I mean, there was an instance when I was literally on set on live TV, getting a call from CNN, uh, booking me for another hit in the next hour. I mean, that is the kind of, you know, pace uh, and expectation that comes with, with these jobs. Because of this White House, because of where all of us work, uh, it's just constant. So I think one of the things is learn to say no and also learn to say, learn to know that no is actually a complete sentence. You don't have to say no, I can't do it because this, this, that, and a third. No theory. Um, and, and I think what, what you said too. Just I need to learn of, that. Yeah, I've yeah. not learned that yeah, actually. Just no, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I just thought, find things you like. I mean, for, for you it's Grey's Anatomy, which I find stressful. For, for, for me, it's I watch a lot of HGTV, right? Fixer Upper, yes. Kip and Joanna, yes. I love that. House the Hunters. House Hunters. Over yeah, Shonda? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No. <laughs> and Darlene, you do yoga. Well, I run, and you can't be texting and writing and reading your phone when you're running. Um, I also do yoga, and that's an hour without the phone. You can't, again, do texting and all that stuff when you're in a downward dog. So I <laughs> second everything that Nia has said. You do have to carve out little pockets of time here and there. A couple of weeks ago, I took myself to the movies. Um, what did you see? I, I was just trying to remember. I saw the, I saw the post. OK, so it's still. Thank <laughs> you. And you forgot that? Oh. <laughs> I couldn't remember the other day that the State of the Union was just last week. Yeah, that's true. I'll say that's this true. really quickly. I once took a nap at like, because I had gone on a show at like 6 a.m. and was just dead tired. I woke up and Amarosa had been fired. <laughs> <laughs> just happens. Hey, bro, don't. I don't. didn't say a word. Don't. No, that's don't. A, that's a don't. Girl. Used to be. Um, for me, self care is important. <laughs> Um, well, because you have your kids. I have my kids, but I need self care too, though. <laughs> um, I do a lot of driving, and I drive two hours basically each way every day. So I just kind of like decompress there, go home, and I try to watch mindless television mm -hmm. if I can, something that I can get engrossed in that takes me away from all of that. When I'm not on TV or whatever, which is, yeah, no. CNN. It's like I just try, yeah, and I need to learn to say no. And I try to go into some kind of mindless state because really, it's bad when you wake up in the middle of the night and pick up your cell phone off your nightstand and see who has text messaged you, mm -hmm. what you've missed. And I think we've all been guilty of that. Mm -hmm. um, my day is 24 seven, it never stops. And, but I have got to learn and I'm, and I'm doing this now. I'm also now for my health and my well-being. I'm doing strength, tra strength training and doing the ropes and all that stuff. It is, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get there. So, um, <laughs> no, I mean, and, and enjoying my kids more, you know, taking them out of town, just, just going places and having fun. We're gonna, my daughter's got a Hamilton workshop next weekend. She's at the Hamilton workshop, and we're gonna do a couple of theater shows and that, and then just mindless things, just, just enjoying life, because there's life beyond this. And, and for those of you who are stuck on the TV, I love CNN. Nia and I love it. It's a great network. It's a great <laughs> network. But there's, how many of you are political, um, what is it, political junkies? Oh, Lord, there's a thing called self-care. Back away and then come back. <laughs> the, the roller coaster, and what I've learned is the roller coaster will always keep, it will be, it'll keep going. But it's okay to get off because I'm going to get back on it. So I, when I get off, I breathe. So that's what I do. And there have been stories of reporters, like I, I lost a friend, I'll never forget, um, Michael Feeney, who died at 32, um, the day that the Iowa caucus happened, I like couldn't get out of bed because I was crying so hard. There, are, you, it, I've gotten reminders from the world that yes, imp work is important, and he had just gotten his dream job at CNN. He was going to be an entertainment reporter. Yeah. He was supposed to be moving to Atlanta when he died, and the idea is that like yes, work is important, but you really want to savor the moments because you just don't know what's going to happen. And you don't want to, I always think, I don't want to be an old woman sitting in my rocking chair, which I hope that's what I turn into, and think back and say, oh my god, I worked so hard, I couldn't even see my kids, or I'm now divorced because I didn't even answer my husband's phone calls half the time because I was so entrenched in work. 
um, you know, reporters that are dying of brain aneurysms. I, a local New York reporter did that, and her mother was like, she worked too hard. So really, it's, it's, it's not just like a fun thing to do. It's like a life or death thing in my mind. Mm -hmm. But you can work hard, but then carve right. out time for self-care. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, I want to say, like, thank you for that question. And thank you guys. You're amazing. This is why thank you, you are amazing. Oh, thank you, guys. <laughs> and, and I just want you to know you that there are bags. Here. We got gift bags. Oh, boy. We got gifts. There are, wait, there are bags. We've got gifts. And so, because this is what we do and who we are, bam. Uh -huh. <laughs> Black journalists, we do matter. I was scared you were going to give me George Washington gear because I was Oh, no, no, no. Oh, did you hear that? She was Sorry, afraid we were going to give her George Washington gear. You were afraid of that? <laughs> <laughs> That's because, oh, because you're Georgetown. Cross anyway, I just want to say thank you guys again for coming, and thank you guys for coming out. Yes, um, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.